Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Partnership Group for Science and Engineering, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this Bacon and Headheads, Eggheads event. I'm Mark Laflamme, a long-standing member of the dedicated group of volunteers that make up the Bacon and Eggheads Committee. We work on behalf of the Partnership Group for Science and Engineering, which is a registered not-for-profit umbrella organization of 21 national science and engineering societies. This translated to more than 50,000 scientists and engineers represented by our organization. The Bacon and Egghead series is meant to offer parliamentarians and decision makers the opportunity to hear firsthand about the excellent research being done in Canada. Le comité de sélection choisit avec beaucoup de soin ces conférenciers. Ils ou elles doivent être des chercheurs chevronnés et des innovateurs exceptionnels. Mais comme Papineau, ces conférenciers doivent être aussi d'excellents orateurs capables de faire le lien entre leur recherche et les préoccupations d'actualité. Also very important is the opportunity that this series provides for our parliamentary and policymakers to ask candid questions about the implications of the research for Canadian society future policy development. All members of our audience will be able to submit their questions at any time during or after the talk using the Q&A panel within Zoom. Our speaker will be given an opportunity to respond to the submitted questions at the end of our talk, with first priority being given to questions coming from members of parliament and senators who are joining us today. The Bacon and Egghead series gratefully acknowledges the support we have received from the organizations which were shown in the slides during the waiting period. We are grateful to all of them, including NSERC, Canary, and McGill University. We also appreciate the support provided by our patrons, the Speaker of the House of Commons and the Speaker of the Senate. At this point, I will now turn the platform over to Professor Alejandro Adem, President of NSERC, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Good afternoon, everyone. The CRS Angers is partenaire des petits déjeuners avec des têtes à Papineau depuis de nombreuses années. Et je suis heureux de le représenter ici aujourd'hui. When I last addressed a bacon and eggheads audience last February, it was in person. I said that we as Canadians were living with change, challenges, and disruption. Now, as much as at any time in the past, it was a true statement, an important consideration for decision makers as they frame policies and priorities going forward. Years from now, it will still be an important framing consideration. But at the moment, we live with COVID-19. Given the unprecedented impact of the pandemic, however, the words change, challenges, and disruption seem very much to be understatements. Mis à part le, la COVID, la science et le génie sont clairement les principaux moteurs à long terme des grands bouleversements. Mais ils sont aussi la source des connaissances qu'il nous faut pour comprendre les changements qui souviennent, surmonter les défis que nous rencontrons et prendre des décisions fondées sur des données probantes dans l'intérêt des Canadiens et des citoyens du monde entier. Although COVID-19 is of course our immediate emergency, climate change is also an emergency. NSERC invests simultaneously and significantly in discovery research and market-driven innovation, linking the academic community with industry. Our budget is over 1.2 billion annually. Le fonds accordé par le CRS Angers appuie chaque année le travail de plus de 11 000 professeurs et de plus de 30 000 étudiants de niveau post-secondaire et stagiaires post-doctoraux dont les tirs d'entre eux sont formés en milieu industriel. De plus, ces investissements ont favorisé l'établissement de 3500 partenariats entre diverses entreprises canadiennes et le milieu post-secondaire. As well, we work with a variety of partners to tell Canadians about the power of science and engineering. These outreach efforts encourage students to consider science careers 
and help the broader community understand the science and technology that defines our world and our challenges. L'un des exemples de ces partenariats est la collaboration avec les partenariats en faveur des sciences et de la technologie pour la tenue des petits déjeuners avec des têtes à papillons. Cet après-midi, j'ai le grand plaisir de vous présenter Dr. Elena Bennett, titulaire de la chaire de recherche du Canada en sciences de la durabilité à l'Université de McGill. Dr. Bennett has received many awards, including an NSERC DC Fellowship, and she leads NSERC ResNet, a Canada-wide network of interdisciplinary scholars working to improve environmental decision-making. I note that she got her PhD at the University, University of Wisconsin in Madison, where in fact I was a faculty member for around 20 years. And I learned um, about the work of Aldo Leopold. One of my favorite books is the San County Almanac, one of the first uh, works that became very popular talking about preservation of the ecosystems. I expect her talk looking at how we can build a better future after the pandemic will frame well the changes, challenges, and disruption we will face, and how we should best respond. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Elena Bennett. Merci. Thank you so much, Professor Adam, for that, that lovely introduction. I'm just going to get my screen shared here. Wonderful. And now you should all be able to see my slides. Okay. So thank you very much for that introduction. And thanks to everyone who is uh, able to be here uh, today. It's, I'm just thrilled to be able to, uh, to speak with you all. So I want to start in the Anthropocene, that's a new geologic epoch in which humankind has emerged as a globally significant, and I'll add potentially intelligent force capable of reshaping the planet. And so what you're looking at here is starting at the very bottom on the right, uh, the epics starting from the longest ago and working our way up to the current official at epic, the Holocene. The Anthropocene, which I'll add at the top, is not an official epic that gets decided by the International Union of Geological Sciences, but it's a useful term that scientists and many others use to acknowledge the magnitude of human impact on the planet. So what does it mean to live in the Anthropocene? And I want to take a look at that first by looking at what it meant to live in the Holocene. So this graph shows living conditions on Earth over the last 100,000 years through a proxy for global temperature. And 100,000 years is about half of the span of the existence of modern humans on the, on the planet. And what you see is that starting the farthest to go on the left, the blue line, which is the proxy for temperature, bounces around a lot. And that causes crises for people. So for example, uh, people leave Africa 80,000 years ago in a climate crisis. We colonize Australia in another climate crisis 60,000 years ago, etc. All of these moments sort of driven, at least in part, by temperature crises. And then here, about 10,000 years ago, we enter the Holocene. And the hallmark of the Holocene is that it's this remarkably stable temperature period. Uh, and about a thousand years into that period, we develop agriculture. And from that comes literally everything else you know in human history, the Greeks, the Romans, the Enlightenment, so on and so, and so forth. Uh, and that relatively stable period is really the only state of the planet that we know for certain can support contemporary human societies. And so it's important to think a little bit about what's happening now uh, and why I wanted to start talking about the Anthropocene. And, and the reason for that is that this blue line, which you can't see, is just shooting up uh, into a, a different rate that we've never seen before at a sort of remarkable and, and worrisome rate. And why that's worrisome is that we don't really understand what the outcome will be because the climate system is one that operates with thresholds. So we often assume that systems work like the image on the left, 
that a given amount of change in some external condition leads to the same relative amount of change in the ecosystem. So uh, an example from my daily life might be that if I plant three tomato plants in my garden, I get 30 tomatoes. And if I plant five plants, I'm gonna get 50 tomatoes. That's a linear system. Uh, but it turns out that climate works like the system on the right, where that sort of behavior happens for a little while, but then we find ourselves in this steeper slope where just a small change in the external condition leads to a big change in our ecosystem uh, state. Um, and, and that leads to situations where we uh, have difficulty controlling the system and don't necessarily understand what the outcomes are going to be. And in fact, climate is just one of nine different systems that Johan Rockström and Will Steffen and their colleagues determined have these sorts of thresholds globally that threaten planetary stability. And they identified and then quantified the numerical location of nine planetary boundaries. And that's shown in this red circular line here. Uh, and they quantified also the state of the planet relative to those boundaries. That's the length of the petals. And you can see that we've crossed boundaries for genetic diversity, for biogeochemical flows, and we're starting to near the boundary for climate change and for land use and land system change. And what we know is that if we cross these boundaries, we anticipate threshold sorts of responses in planetary systems that will impact human life. And recent evidence further indicates that some of these nine planetary boundaries may interact with each other so that crossing one may pull others across the line as well. So one thing that happens when I talk about thresholds and planetary boundaries and the future of the planet is that people start to bring up images like this one in their heads. This sort of talk really strikes fear in all of us. It puts images of dystopian destruction in our heads and um, there's a good reason for that. We should be concerned. The pace of change that we're seeing is really unprecedented and the future is definitely uncertain. We are living in a times of change for, for more reasons than just one, and we need to take decisive action. But it is also true that having images like this of the future in our heads, especially having only images like this in our heads, um, is really problematic. We know that we tend to steer towards what we're looking at, even if we know that that's not the direction we want to, to go in. So having only negative visions of the future makes it actually more likely that we will head towards one despite our best intentions. So what I want to talk about today is my belief that we can have a better future, a good or perhaps even as this piece of artwork suggests, a fabulous Anthropocene. Uh, and, and I do, the professor in me wants me to stop and point out to you that uh, as lovely as this artwork is, the Anthropocene is officially an epic and not, uh, and not an era, but we can have a fabulous one nevertheless. So I think many of us hold a narrative in our heads about people and the environment that people are generally bad uh, and that the key to a better future is to try to restrict or restrain us to ensure that we do the right thing. I find that narrative to be not always true and, and also not always particularly useful. And I wanna propose that achieving the world that we want to live in, this fabulous Anthropocene epic, requires that we find a different sort of narrative about our role on the planet, a role in which we're stewards, much as was laid out in the Aldo Leopold book that Professor Adem mentioned in his introduction, a role in which people can be and even are a force for good. So let's talk about how we make that sort of evolution to a better future. So I have two main messages for my talk today. And the first one is just simply a better world, a good Anthropocene is indeed possible for us to get to. And the second is that there's three things that I think we need to do to get ourselves there. The first one that I'll talk about is that we need better visions of what good Anthropocenes could look like. Um, Everyone's vision of that is gonna be a little bit different and that's okay. The second is that we need to recognize, amplify and multiply all the small efforts that people all around us are already doing to try to make that, their world better. And I'll argue that people are already out there doing all sorts of things to try to make a better life for themselves and their neighbors, including their other species neighbors. 
And those are good lessons for us to learn from. And then finally, we need to develop some sort of integrated metrics or measures to help us understand the sort of progress that we're making toward a better Anthropocene and how we can do a better job uh, of steering the ship towards what it is that we want. So my first thing that I was suggesting we need to do is develop better visions. So why do I start with visions and narratives? Well, it turns out that stories and narratives are extremely powerful. They explain our reality, but they also really create it before our very eyes. And the other reality is there's a lot of scientific work that explores the problems that people are creating. And it, it isn't that that isn't important or that there aren't new things to be learned by studying the problems even more closely. But I would argue that we need to spend more time and attention on solutions and stories about those solutions. And scientists have a particular form of storytelling that we use called scenario building. And scenarios are just stories about the future. We usually tell them in sets because it's useful actually to compare several different storylines. And those stories have some sort of logical plot and narrative that govern the manner in which events unfold. And they can be qualitative stories, they can be quantitative stories, or they can be, be both. We can have a qualitative story and add some models to that. They were first used by the military, then picked up by businesses and industry, and then finally in the last few decades by global environmental assessments who've made good use of these uh, sorts of scenario development techniques. But so far, a lot of our efforts in the global scientific community, especially the ones that we're, we're thinking about positive futures, we have these visions that are sort of poorly articulated, they're a little bit utopian, they're a little bit fantasy, and they, they tend to, I think, overestimate the power of mainstream or conventional strategies to create the kind of real or maybe a little bit more radical change that we need. So for example, I was involved about 20 years ago in building these scenarios from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment we wanted to show the difference between a world in which people work together to solve environmental problems and a world in which people, uh, people didn't, they built walls uh, to keep poor away from rich. And that's fine, but it's not particularly insightful. It puts all of our hope for the future on one single modification working together to bring about planetary scale uh, change. And in fact, we find that nearly all the scenarios that the global community has developed feature the same drivers of change. Things like how people interact with each other, how we feel about the environment and development, the role of technology, what happens with population. And it isn't that those aren't important, but that they're very well explored. Uh, and because they follow the same handful of ideas about how the future will unfold and the key drivers, these scenarios tend to lack the sorts of rich detail, the surprises, the transformations that actually are the hallmark of how history has uh, actually unfolded. And they miss the really radical changes that happen. So if I, when I think about developing scenarios for the future, I think that a future world is likely to be radically different. And it's really hard to think about a radically different world, one where our values, our cultures, even power and gender relations that influence social norms and behavior are changing. That's, I use the example that it's roughly like standing in the Middle Ages and trying to look forward and explain the world of today and know what things are gonna stick around and what things aren't. You can imagine that our effort is like standing in the world of today and trying to picture some sort of radically uh, different future. And that's obviously appealing but it's also really very difficult to do. So what we have been working on and what I propose that we can do is that we can start with things that people are already doing. It turns out that when we look around, that as people become aware of threats to society and nature, that many people are increasingly engaging in strategies to create a more just, a more prosperous and a more ecologically diverse world. In other words, they're trying to create a good Anthropocene. And we have this emergence of innovative ways of living, of new ways of thinking, different means to connect people and nature. And they're already around us today. 
And we call these seeds of good Anthropocenes. They're seeds because they're not widespread, they're not well known, they can be social, they can be technological or economic, uh, they can be organizations or movements or new ways of acting that just appear to be contributing to the creation of a future that is more just, prosperous, and sustainable. And we call them seeds because they're, they're, they're like seeds that might grow into a better future. And they help uh, to direct us when otherwise we might tend to overanalyze and think about why things aren't working. They direct our attention towards what is working. So let me tell you about uh, two of those, just to give you a little better sense of what I mean when I say a seed of a good Anthropocene. So this is one example from far away. This is the Health and Harmony Project, and they work in Indonesian Borneo to address human health and deforestation by partnering with local communities to provide low-cost health care in exchange for commitments to reduce deforestation. And what they've seen since 2007 when they started working is an 88% reduction in illegal logging households. They've seen a, a stabilization and even now a regrowth uh, in uh, forest with about 20,000 hectares growing back, habitat for about 2,500 endangered orangutans protected, and improved healthcare access. Every measure of healthcare that they assess has improved, including a, a pretty stunning 90% decrease in the mortality rate for kids under the age of five. And they've done that basically by reconnecting uh, forests to human health. And they figured out this connection by listening to people. The leader spent about a year just trying to understand what the problem was before she realized that people weren't logging to uh, make a lot of extra money or get rich. They were doing it because their mom was sick and they needed a little bit of money for, for healthcare. And that's how she came up with this idea of connecting those two. And of course, there's many examples from right here at home in Canada. So one that's just down the street from me that I particularly am fond of is Centre Paul Roulon. So as with the Health and Harmony example, this is also about cycles and reconnecting systems. In this case, the very name Roulon means rolling, which gives us the idea of a cycle. So this is an organization that connects, and it connects people to rooftop gardens, to urban pollinators, to food, and of course, to each other. It has three branches, a Meals on Wheels program, a Farm and Garden program, and a set of collectives that address sustainability issues and interests around, uh, around Montreal. And this is a seed that's been around for a while, but I think if we look around now, at least for me, as I look around during this pandemic, I see many Canadians trying to do new things to build a better future for themselves and their neighbors. So the Seeds of Good Anthropocene project has used an international participatory process to identify over 500 different Seeds of Good Anthropocenes from around the world. And we're studying those. We're studying them to try to understand how and why they occur. We have a database about them with all the information we need to know to understand how they're established, how they grow and spread and inspire change elsewhere. And we're using them to develop a new model to uh, method to tell novel scenarios about better futures. So first, let me talk a little bit about uh, what we're learning about the seeds. So the first thing that we're focused on is uh, how they create greater change, how they create potential for transformation, even though they're at the current moment small, we see that they scale in different ways. Some of them jump from one community to another where a, new, a different community tries an idea that worked somewhere else. Some of them scale by changing values or reconnecting people one to another. And from studying these, we've been able to develop a theory about how change happens. It starts down here with these isolated experiments. And as those happen, they fuel the articulation of new stories and narratives, which in turn creates more experiments and more seeds. And as that happens, people's lived experiences and their narratives start changing. And that brings us into this period of transition where if we're lucky and get a window of opportunity, uh, then we have the potential to create a new regime where these become uh, the norm. 
In addition to studying how the seeds can lead to transformation, we're also using the seeds in a novel scenario development process uh, that mixes these future wheels that you see here, where we imagine all the positive impacts uh, of different seeds and use that to try to imagine a positive future. So we start uh, here in the center uh, with a seed and we imagine the first order impacts of those seeds, then the second order impacts and so on until we have really a vision of what a better or different future looks like. And then once we have a vision of our better future, we use this uh, three horizons framework to try to imagine a pathway by which we get to that future. So this pathway has, uh, has three different parts to it. It has a first horizon, that's things that are common now uh, that we need to let go of to get to our new uh, future. Uh, maybe things uh, uh, that we don't wanna have anymore or that are standing in the way of getting to a better future. We have the third horizon here, that's the seeds. That's the pockets of the future that exist now as potential futures that we wanna have grow and into a future that's dominated by those seeds and by the way that those seeds work. And then in the middle, we have the second horizon that really describes the sort of turbulent space uh, that happens in the middle. And what we've seen by studying these seeds is they help us to understand the connection between parts of our lives and the potential for a better future, including aspects of our lives that can change the world, but haven't been featured in existing global scenarios until now. So some of the things that have showed up in our scenarios over and over again are things like changing gender relations, changes in the way that we approach work or how we conceive of ownership versus a shared economy, Features that might not immediately speak to us about the future of the environment per se, but that turn out to be very meaningful drivers of change. And the seed scenario method helps to open up novel pathways by showing us some of what's underneath the sorts of Anthropocene challenges that we face. So I wanna stop talking there about the vision. We do need a vision and we're learning how to amplify those visions so that as this quote explores, we don't start uh, building our ship by collecting wood and cutting planks and assigning work, but that we start by awakening in people the longing for a wide and open sea. And I wanna turn to some thoughts about how we can measure or assess our progress towards our visions. You know, everyone's vision of what's good is different. We could just throw up our hands, ask people to do better, but then we really just end up with a mess. So we need some way to think about, to assess whether we're on a path that's leading to a better Anthropocene or not. And I'm gonna argue that we need integrated measures. And kind of amazingly to me, although we have really good measures for one indicator or another, for one aspect of sustainability or a different one, we don't yet have a very good generalized integrated way to measure our progress toward a better world. So I'm gonna turn our attention a little bit more fully to Canada for this last section of the talk. Uh, as you all know, we live in an incredibly rich, incredibly diverse country. It is uh, diverse in its ecosystems and its biota. It is diverse in its people, its cultures, its values, and it's incredibly rich in natural resources. And because of that, it's also a Canada, it's also a country with its economy strongly rooted in resource extraction. So here on the left in colors, uh, you're seeing our uh, primary net exports that make up uh, a substantial part of our national exports, things like energy, metal and minerals, wood and wood products agri-food and fish, uh, et cetera. So this is a really strong part of what we think of when we think of Canada. And luckily Canada is now on a path that has acknowledged the importance of the environment and of sustainability. And we see that in plans uh, like this one to achieve a sustainable future. We see it in plans for a new green economy that unfold federally, as well as in provinces, in territories, even in cities and towns. And these sorts of things, these plans 
uh, are very important steps forward. They form a piece of that vision that is our first step. But we don't know very well yet how to make progress or how to assess whether we are overall making progress, in part because these systems, so the ones that the lakes and food, uh, our connection to nature, wildlife populations and climate are linked, even though we end up representing them in these plans as separate chapters or separate areas of action. And that linkage demands a new kind of science, a science where scientists are working in partnership with institutions that make decisions about ecosystem management and that are undertaking research that integrates across services, across sectors, and across scales. So let me dig in a little bit more into why we need integrated measures. So let's say we're trying to assess the state of this landscape. Well, we could measure the amount of food, canola or barley or whatever that's produced, and that would be a pretty good measure of the value or importance of this agricultural landscape. But it might be deceptive if we don't account for changes in farming practices. So things like new technologies or new fertilizers that might increase production, but they might be doing that in a non-sustainable way. So we might also be deceiving ourselves if we aren't measuring the subsequent losses in soil quality or water quality problems that are, might be associated with farming practices. So that's one reason why we need integrated measures, because the things that we get from these landscapes interact. And another reason is that places interact. So uh, we have, we're talking about progress for uh, one global progress or one national progress, but that's made up of what's happening in different regions. And as the state of the system comes down this pathway, we're making decisions that are moving that region in different directions. And not only that, but those regions interact with one another through trade and through movement of people and other uh, influences. And that makes a really complex system where control is very difficult, probably not even really possible. So we have to learn how to navigate as this is uh, unfolding. And that also really calls for more integrated measurements. Without those integrated measurements, what happens is that we make decisions in a sector by sector, region by region way, even though we have evidence that there's interactions between sectors across locations and among uh, resources through time. So we look at a forest like this and we know it has trees and it stores carbon and it harbors biodiversity and it's beautiful, I might wanna go hiking there. But it turns out that what we measure about that landscape is mostly this. So maybe because our economy is rooted in resources in most Canadian landscapes and most working landscapes around the world, the focus has been on cheap and reliable and efficient production of individual benefits like food or energy or timber, uh, ignoring the effects on other benefits or the effects on other places. And that leaves us in a situation where we're making really critically important decisions about the future of Canada and the future of Canadian resources in an isolated and piecemeal fashion with a pretty limited picture of the ecological, the economic, and the social risks that are associated with those decisions. So scientists have come up with one possible integrated measurement, and that's called ecosystem services, or sometimes nature's contributions to people. And I think it offers a great way to start thinking about this. And what that does is it tells us that when we look at this landscape, we could measure the food, we can measure the soy that's being produced, but we could also measure the wood or the maple syrup that someone might be tapping in those trees. Or we could look at pest regulation and water quality regulation and the climate regulation that happens from the carbon storage that's happening uh, in those woodlots. Or we can think about deer hunting, aesthetic beauty, and nature appreciation. So what ecosystem services do is emphasize, push us to consider all of the things that are important to us in these landscapes. And we typically measure them by uh, looking at these pedal diagrams like this, where the length of the pedal tells us something about the amount of services that are provided. And by doing that in many different places, 
we might look, for example, to see that a, a landscape that looks like this gives us a lot of forest recreation and carbon sequestration, but not so much agriculture. Or that a different landscape gives us a lot of crop production and soil phosphorus retention and soil organic matter, but not so much forest recreation. Or that yet a different landscape gives us some mix. And what if we knew that certain actions could elongate petals uh, without shortening other petals at the same time? So my new uh, project, my new network across Canada, which is called NSERC ResNet that was mentioned before, we're working to try to measure these ecosystem services in a series of different landscapes across Quebec to try to understand how these uh, uh, ecosystem services uh, interact and how they're changing over time. And we're pulling all of those together across those landscapes by comparing what's happening in those landscapes. And we're just getting started. We just got to the end of our first year, a year marked mostly by COVID-related stoppages in our ability to get out and do field work. But we're really excited about the potential for where this uh, is going. And in particular, what we're trying to build towards is an observatory network for Canada of ecosystem services. So in other words, to build that sort of integrated measure that we think could, we could help use to assess our progress towards a better future uh, across the whole country. So let me just come back to the main messages for a minute before I finish up. So first, just a reminder, a better world is possible and we can make it come about. And there's three things that we need to do to build that better future. We talked about developing better visions so we know what we're aiming for. We talked about learning how to recognize, amplify and multiply small efforts towards transformation to a better future. And we talked about the need to develop integrated metrics to measure progress toward a better Anthropocene. So, I think no talk right now is complete without uh, mentioning the pandemic, and it is a real hit. It's causing significant distress for many people and many places across the, the country. But I think we're starting to see, especially now as we start to see the light at the end of the tunnel of a, a, a long uh, retreat, that it's an opportunity to rebuild, and there's many ways to go forward with that rebuilding. We can build back better, but we need visions of what that better looks like. What things do we want to build back? What things do we not particularly want to build back? And for that, we need visions of a thriving Canada. And so I would just encourage you as I finish up to think about what your vision is of a thriving country. Do you think about agriculture or cities? towns, marine systems, Canada's Arctic, its parks and urban areas. So I'll, I, I'll stop there with this encouragement to, I hope you spend some time thinking a little bit about what your vision uh, of a better Canada is and how we can bring it about. Thank you, Jerome. I'd like to invite the Honorable Carol Hughes, Assistant Deputy Speaker and Deputy Chair of the Committee of the Whole to offer our thanks to Dr. Bennett. Mute, start my video. Ah, ça fonctionne, ça fonctionne. Merci. Alors, merci beaucoup pour la belle présentation. Uh, C'était assez intéressant. Um, euh, J'ai vu qu'il y avait beaucoup de questions, qu'il y en a qui n'ont pas pu être répondues. Alors, c'est espéré qu'ils peuvent vous les envoyer pour que vous puissiez euh, euh, donner, euh, les informer mieux et puis répondre à ces, ces questions qui étaient très intéressantes et très importantes. Euh, 
So first of all, uh, I also uh, just, I, I didn't want to throw a question in there. I could see there were so many of them, but uh, I just want to say that, uh, you know, your topic today kind of aligns with, well, really aligns as well with uh, the Health Research Caucus who had um, a Zoom meeting this week as well. And and uh, it was a reception uh, to inform parliamentarians about environmental health and climate change in Canada and how they're intricately linked and, and you did a fabulous job uh, in adding that piece uh, to it as well. I couldn't go to all of the Zoom rooms but uh, that they had, but I, obviously I can think of Dr. Villeneuve who talked about respiratory health uh, benefits of urban uh, green uh, greenness and uh, and how that actually impacts on people's well-being where people have been sleeping more. Their mental health is, has improved quite a bit and the work that's being done right now um, in Ottawa uh, especially when they're looking at moving the one of the hospitals and how they're looking at regreening uh, a lot of those areas. So uh, it's quite interesting and really appreciate your feedback. So I want to uh, thank you again for your presentation. I want to thank, uh, thank um, uh, Paxi for uh, all that they do, all of the sponsors that are uh, intertwined into, uh, into Paxi uh, for putting on these really important talks because we learn so much. And hopefully uh, some of those will help define uh, the, the policy changes that, that are required uh, or the direction and, um, and planning that is being done right now, especially as you've indicated, we're looking at uh, COVID uh, and everything is, is really in, intricately uh, linked. So, um, and amazingly, they're talking about vaccines uh, in the house today as well. So I just want to, again, thank everybody for your participation. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll end there. So merci beaucoup. So thank you all for coming. Uh, please let your colleagues, uh, please tell your colleagues if you found this to be an interesting and informative. We'd also like to thank you to take a moment to fill out our survey that will appear in your browser at the end of the Zoom session. Our next sessions will be held on February 18th, 2021. We are excited to be hosting Professor Volker Gertz, who is the Director and CEO of the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Organization International Vaccine Center, located at the University of Saskatchewan. Dr. Gertz will be providing us with an update on the COVID-19 vaccine research that is underway presently in Canada. Please be sure to join us for this event. You can keep up to date with our events by following us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at Ottawa Eggheads or in LinkedIn, where we are the partnership group for the science and engineering. Thanks to everyone for joining us.